always glad to uh, have the chance to come to Columbia. I've, I have a deep, deep uh, affection for this school, and the school has been in my prayers. I'll say this again Saturday afternoon in my lecture, but since it's Saturday afternoon, there may not be anybody there. And uh, we have a lot of students at Abilene Christian who are graduates of Columbia, fine students. I, I'll tell you, the, one of the marks of the job you're doing is the kind of students that you turn out. And, and our opinion down in Abilene is that you're doing a great job because we get some really super people who come our way who've been through the program here. And one of them stopped me I guess Friday before I left the campus and said, uh, tell the people there that there are a lot of us here at Abilene who are much in prayer for Columbia. We don't always know what God intends to do. Sometimes God wants things to go on, sometimes he doesn't. We don't know, but we certainly carry to God our deepest desires and trust in his wisdom and trust that he can turn things in directions that we're not able to anticipate. I hope that here the prayers that are prayed will be answered in terms of the survival of this school. I want to talk about the dream defiled, the dream continued, and the material that we're going to be using will be the opening chapters of Genesis, the same material that has been used as a basis for the lectures that are being given through the course of this lectureship. And I want to start with the first two chapters of Genesis and make some comments on that, about what God's dream is for man to the extent that any human being is able to fathom that and then talk uh, tomorrow morning about the dream as it was defiled and the consequences of that defilement and then on the third morning if all goes well about the plan of God to overwhelm human failure and to see to it that the dream continues. As I've been reflecting on the early chapters of Genesis, I'm deeply impressed with the obvious sense of divine revelation that permeates these chapters. The picture that we get there of the nature of reality, the nature of man, the nature of the God-man relationship, it seems to me is not something that some person would have figured out from observing the human race, but rather has to be something which has been given by God that these things are true about people and about God and about the God-man relationship. There are two stories of the creation. I don't mean to imply by that some uh, Velhausian theory about sources, but I think anyone who reads from whatever perspective, even from the most conservative, I must admit that there are two stories here. The first creation story goes down to the middle of verse 4 of Genesis chapter 2. It is like a hymn. It's magnificent, majestic, stately, depicting the great acts of God in the six creation days. One wonders if perhaps this was not something that was used in the context of worship in ancient Israel because it has the stanzas that make it sound like something that might have been liturgical in nature. And it deals with the entirety of creation, the whole thing. The creation days and the things that were made on those days and prefacing all those, the fact that everything that exists comes from the hands of God and that God took chaos and he, he imposed his, himself on chaos and brought out of chaos order or arrangement so that the world is not a chaotic world, but is an ordered world. And then you have the second story, which begins then in the middle of verse 4 of chapter 2, and this story is not concerned with the sweeping picture of all of creation, but this story now focuses on the creation of man. As if the Bible is saying to us, now that we've seen the big picture of everything, let's go back now and look at the picture of man. Let's bring the camera in on man and focus that in large perspective and observe that. And so in chapter 2 we have all of those details about the creation of man which are only implied in chapter 1. 
We are told where man is placed. We are told in verses 10 through 14 in a passage that may be a little bit puzzling that the place where man is to be found is at the very navel of the earth. I pondered myself, what is the meaning of this paragraph in chapter 2 beginning in verse 10 about the four rivers? How does that fit theologically into the story? And it seems to me that what the book of Genesis is saying is that this place where God put man is the center and out of this center flow these rivers which go out and water the entire earth. There is no more significant or important place where man could be put than this place. And then you have the word of the Lord about the trees of the garden, the two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And then in the subsequent part of chapter 2, a text which I expect will be cited frequently this week, we have God making man a helper fit for him. None of the animals is appropriate, so from his rib, God makes a helper, and there is a play on words, as I'm sure you've observed in verse 23. It is one of the few plays on words which uh, remains in English from Hebrew, woman and man. You can see the similarity there in Hebrew. The word for woman is isha, and the word for man is ish. So you add the feminine ending to the word ish, and you get isha, and so the play is found there in both of these languages. There are questions I ask myself about these two chapters. I guess you're going through a minefield when you talk about Genesis 1 and 2 because so many people are so sure about so many things here that I suspect they maybe oughtn't to be quite so sure about. Who wrote these chapters? Well, traditionally we say that these chapters are mosaic, that they come from Moses, although I believe even very conservative scholars are saying these days that there may have been various editions and that the actual written form in which we have it, though it certainly goes back to the time of Moses, may not have been written down this way until some sometime subsequent to Moses. I don't know about that, but normally we consider this to be mosaic, which means that it was written at the time that Moses lived, depending on whether you accept the high chronology or the low chronology, somewhere between 1500 and 1200 B.C., how old is the world? Well, the world is much, much older than that, so Moses is exceedingly remote from the creation of the world when he writes, much further away than you and I are from some of the important events of our history. And it's a long, long, long time ago, and as far as I know, there were no written records that came down from the beginning, because there was no one there in the beginning to write these things down. When the world was made, there was no one there with a camcorder. There was no one there taking notes. There was no one there with a tape recorder, as I'm wired up here to all these different machines. No one was there. No one was made. When all that happened that preceded the creation of man, so how does anyone know what happened back then? How does anyone know what it was like? Well, no one knows from observation. Uh, it has to come in some other way. Well, maybe God whispered in someone's ear, here's the way it happened, maybe so, but the Bible just doesn't tell us how all that took place. Why was it written down? Why is it that uh, centuries, millennia, who knows how long after creation, now all of this comes to be written down? Why is it that at one time the people did not have a record of creation and then by the providence and guidance of God they do have a record of creation? What kinds of questions are being answered by the writing down of this material? What would you imagine? Well, maybe because the nations around Israel are making certain claims for their gods. And so the Israelites are saying, no, it is all created by the God whom we serve. And all of these other things that you claim are gods are not gods because they are creations of the God who has chosen us and directed us through our history, led us out of Egypt and so on. Maybe these things are written down so we can be told something about what God is like. Maybe these things are written down so we can be told something about the nature of the world. Maybe these things are written down so that man can learn something about himself. Have you ever asked the question, as a human being, what kind of a creature am I? 
Have you ever pondered yourself and realized how much about yourself you don't know? And yet if you don't know it, who does know it? Wrapped up within your own psyche, within your own body, your own being, your own ego, are, are a great number of mysteries. They're just a lot of things you don't know about yourself. What kind of a creature am I? As an example of Homo sapiens, what is a man like? For example, just to illustrate, if you go in the average Bible class in the Church of Christ today, and the question comes up, is man basically good or is man basically bad? Through the room who are going to say they're wrong, of course, that man is basically good. Oh, I believe men are basically good. And you will have others who will say, no, I don't think man is basically good. I believe if man left to himself, if man is left to himself, he will be self-centered. Well, I think the second is right and the first is wrong. Not that man can't do some good things, but you get this disagreement. Well, what kind of a creature is man then? Will he automatically do good if left to himself? Will he automatically do evil if left to himself? Or is there something in between here? Maybe it's that kind of question that these materials in Genesis are intending to answer. But what we have to recognize is that the record is being written down at a period very remote from the occurring of the events. Now there are people who wish to turn to the first uh, chapters of Genesis and read them like they would read a history of the Second World War, or a history of the Civil War, or a history of the presidency, uh, presidents of America, or the history of Columbus discovering, which is the big thing, you know, here in 1992, 500 years later. And so they are approaching these chapters of Genesis as if they are written in the same way that an historian would write a history of some period today. And there are others who say, no, that really is not the appropriate way to see this material because back in the time of Moses, people did not write history that way. And they go back and examine the ancient records and they say that back then you write what you write from a theological point of view or because you have a particular perspective that you want to offer and what we have here in Genesis is theological. And that if we ask of this material the kind of historical questions that we might ask of someone who writes about the Civil War, we are not asking the kinds of questions that the author is intending to answer. And that when we read this material, we need to read to see what it says about God and man. And when we have seen that, we have seen what the author intends. And these people would say there are a lot of questions we ask about Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 that, that the chapters do not intend to answer and we're not going to get an answer unless we force some kind of an answer from the text that the text itself is not giving. Genesis chapter 1, it seems to me, is not the battleground for a heated debate about the length of the creation days whether they were or were not 24-hour days, I wasn't there, but that's how they're pictured. That's the picture that we are given. And some people want to say, well, the whole Christian faith rests on your opinion about these matters. People want to ask questions about where the serpent came from. Genesis is not concerned about where the serpent came from. There the serpent is. You've got to begin with the fact you got a serpent. Here he is. We're not concerned with where he came from. We're concerned with what he does. Where did Cain's wife come from? Back in the deep south, back when I lived there in the 50s and you had a lot of racial prejudice back before integration, I heard Christians seriously argue, you're not going to believe this, that Cain went to the land of Nod and the land of Nod was a land of apes and Cain married an ape and their offspring was the first black. And I had Christian people say that with a straight face just as seriously as they would say the earth is round. That was just one of the aberrations, abuses of scripture that came out of bias. But the Bible is not concerned about where Mrs. Cain came from and all those other questions that we ask. It is concerned about God and about man. What is God's intent for man? God creates a creature. We are told in chapter 1, verse 26, then God said, let us create man in our image, after our likeness. 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God gives them every plant for food which is upon the face of the earth. And finally, verse 31, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning a sixth day. What is God's intention for this creature, this hairless biped, as C.S. Lewis has said, what is, in, what is his intention uh, in making such a thing as a man? What does he intend for this creature to become? What is God's dream for humanity? That may be too big a question for any human being to try to answer, but I want to suggest three things, at least, that are involved as a part of God's dream for humanity. The first one I can suggest, I cannot spell out or tease out all of the implications of it. I leave it to your imagination. But it seems to me that God's dream for man is that he is creating here a creature that has enormous potential and a sense of dignity and significance that transcends that of any other creature which has been made. I think we determine that from the fact that in the second chapter, man is the pinnacle. Everything else has been done. And now the music prepares us for the climax of the number. And the climax is the creation of man. There is not a man, and there is a man. Where did he come from? Out of God's head. God wanted there to be a man, and where there was no man, there is a man. This creature is greater than any other creature that God has made. No other creature is appropriate to be a mate for this creature. And only of this thing that God has made is it said, let us make him in our image after our likeness. There has been a lot of discussion over the centuries about the meaning of being created in the image of God and a lot of material that is outside of the first chapter of Genesis has been imported into that term to interpret it. It may mean freedom, some say. It may mean uh, the exercise of will. It, it may mean any one of a number of things, but in the context of Genesis 1, it seems to me that the image of God in man has to do with dominion. As God has dominion over all that exists, so under God man is given dominion over all the things that God has made. That's the message of the eighth psalm. You recall the first half of that psalm talks about how small man is. And the second half of that psalm talks about how great man is in his smallness. He is given dominion and so here the image of God is man's dominion. I'm not saying that it may be other evidences that we can bring to it. I am saying it seems to me in context that seems to be the basic meaning of the term. Therefore, man is the crown of creation. Man is in the image of God. And the consequences of that would be in terms of God's dream that, uh, as Rick pointed out so well this morning, that human beings should treat other human beings with respect. Cows are not made in the image of God, nor, nor are baby seals. Sometimes I think the animal rights people feel like any kind of life is as valuable as the life that God has given to a man, and yet I haven't seen a bumper sticker that says, save the cockroaches yet, <laughs> or protect, you, you don't have fire ants here, you don't know the wonder of fire ants, <laughs> you know, preserve the fire ants, no way. Uh, but, but man is something special and so man is given a dignity and respect and when you mistreat another human being you are doing that to one who is so important that he's in the image of God. What demands respect if not another person, you see? And it also means since we are in the image of God 
that it is a betrayal of that image if we descend to the animal level which is exactly what the common perspective towards sexuality and what we've been calling now for 20 or 25 years the sexual revolution is tempting us to do it is saying forget your human being and become like a beast uh, just copulate with others like animals do without any respect for humanity without any respect for compassion and all of those other things that are human just like animals which is a denial of the image of God. Man is a creature with potential because he is given the ability to carry on God's creative work, the reproductive process. So do animals and plants have that, but man is able to voluntarily engage in the uh, reproductive process. Man is a creature of enormous potential because he has been given the gift of freedom of choice. Don't ask me why. I don't think anyone can answer that question. Of all the puzzles that I puzzle over, the one that, that bothers me the most is why God gave us the power to choose, but I'm glad he did. But that shows again that man is a creature with great potential. I don't know what a man might be. Human beings do incredible things. I am convinced that this creature that God has made will accomplish more in terms of what really matters with God that he can never accomplish without God. But I'm convinced that this creature that has been made, given all the things that God has done, is a creature whose potential is enormous. Whatever that says to you about optimism, about energy, about yielding yourself to God, about a contribution that you can make in life, whatever that says, I think that's part of the dream. That here is a creature who will do more than any other creature that has been made. A second thing, it seems to me, that is involved in God's dream, and this is not so much the dream, but it's, uh, it's a, a recognition that we must have to be what God has dreamed of as being, is the realization that we are still creatures. Our creatureliness is a hard thing to accept. Rick talked this morning about freedom and independence and the contemporary feeling that we can run the show for ourselves and yet we're creatures. As, as I said, there was a time when we were not and then we were. All of a sudden, <laughs> man is here. Hey, I wasn't here a second ago and I'm here now. Where'd I come from? I didn't make myself there is awareness and there is personhood and all of that. He owes it all to God. His body, not, body is not his own. His thoughts are not really entirely his own. His mind is not his own. His time is not his own. His actions, his thoughts, none of these ever concern just himself alone. They always must concern the maker. I'm not I'm not taking a position here, pro-choice or pro-life, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But sometimes when I hear people talk about a person can do what they want with their own body, I want to say, but what if it's not your own body? You see, now don't interpret that, I'm not getting into this debate. Don't get me in the corner when it's over, I'm not getting into it. But at least a consideration that ought to be kept in mind is, if it's not entirely our own, what twist does that put on our consideration? To sever the connection with the Creator is for man to, to create or to uh, commit suicide. Not in the normal sense, but in the sense that he's cut off from the real source of life. Man is a creature. That means that man is not the focal point of the universe. One of the great temptations, since you are the center of your own thinking, is to want to think that you are the center of the universe and everything else in the universe makes sense as it moves around you. But you're not the center of the universe. God is the center of the universe. And the proper perspective is not an anthropocentric perspective where you are the center. The proper perspective is to understand that you are in orbit around the real center, which is God himself. God's will and purposes are important and will ultimately prevail. Man's plans cannot ultimately prevail because man is a creature unless they are in consonance with the plans of God. 
so that God's dream for man is that man will find what God has intended for him, not in the assertion of independence, but rather in response. I sometimes think the only thing that man can say to God is, thank you. I suppose there's more than that. I sometimes think that. I don't always think that. Thanks and obedience and worship. And as a creature, under God, made by God, God's dream is that whatever he does for man will be what is best for man, and the human problem is that human beings very often do not understand this. And they assume that God is meddling in their affairs, and that what God says for them is not best for them, and they have a better idea of what's best for them than God does. Man is a creature. The third thing I want to say about God's dream for man, and this is a, a larger perspective, but it uh, filters down into the smaller things, is that man is a creature who is loved by God. Now, if we took what some people believe and put it out in black and white where everyone can see it, it would go something like this. God created man so he could make him miserable and torture him and ultimately damn him. That's why he made man. God is some kind of a sadistic monster who creates creatures so he can do terrible things to them. Not a one of you would say you believe that, but the truth of the matter is that even some Christians, if you really put out in the open what they believe, would believe something like that. They are far more sure that God is intending to damn people than he is to save people, even Christian people. They are, they are, they picture God far more as uh, wanting to condemn, chastise, put down, than they picture God as loving and saving and helping. God is angry rather than being loving. God is always seeing us as bad rather than trying to help us be good. If God is love, then man comes into being because God loves him and intends to give him happiness, intends indeed even to give him himself, which means that as God has made homo sapiens, that, that God has designed as a part of this thing, this creature, that God has designed a number of needs, and that the only way those needs can be satisfied is if the needs are plugged in to God himself, because God is the only real completion of the, the emptiness that is exhibited in human need. And uh, the problem with humanity is that we have all these needs and we're trying to plug in somewhere else and the plug doesn't fit. And so we may seem to have a fit for a time, but we discover there's a short circuit there and that doesn't work and so we unplug and try to get a fit somewhere else. And we find people who've tried to get a fit somewhere who said this is the answer and they find out later it's not the answer and they move on to another thing or they become very, very disillusioned. The one who made the needs is the only one who is able to satisfy the needs. And when God made us, God made us for happiness. When God made man, he entered into fellowship with him. I presume in the garden the sense of unity with God was not uh, one where we seem to have a distance, but it was a, an intimate closeness. If you've read... Uh, C.S. Lewis's book, Paralandra, he talks about Venus, pre-fall Venus, and the eve of that world is, uh, is a lady that he calls the Green Lady, and as the story goes on, she is constantly hearing from the Christ figure in that story who is Maleldil, and she says to Ransom, the earthling who comes, let me see what Maleldil is saying, and you get the sense that there is uh, an intimate closeness between the woman and God, and that God is speaking to her in an interior way. And I wonder if it wasn't like that in the beginning, that there is a sense of fellowship between God 
and man which you and I have never enjoyed in that sense and which very likely we have not anticipated but which someday we hope to enjoy. What does it mean that the man and woman are placed in Eden? What is Eden? Eden is paradise. Now, I don't know what all the conceptions were in those days of having a situation where you have everything that you want. What would your conception be? If I ask you to sketch a picture of being in a place where you had everything you want and you were as happy as you could possibly be, would it be a technological world? Would it be a world with all the audio and video things that we have today? What would it be? Tickets to the World Series? I don't know. What would you want? Well, I think if you could talk to somebody in the world of that day and say what would be the perfect existence, they probably would describe something like Eden. And the text is saying that when God made man, God put man in a place where he was absolutely happy. Nothing there to mar it. No problems, no flaws. Everything that you could possibly want. Because God wants man to be happy. The tree of life is there. And that, I think, represents all of these things that are the deepest satisfactions of human need. And then God's intent that man should be happy is indicated by the creation of a mate. Nothing else that God has made is adequate for this fellowship. And so God makes a sleep fall upon the man and he takes the rib and from it he makes a woman and he makes for him a helper appropriate to him. And we are told that when the two of them are created and given to one another, the last verse of chapter 2, that they are both naked and they are not ashamed. That theme, by the way, is an interesting theme to follow all the way through into chapter 3, and we'll do that on a subsequent day. So all of these things God has done for man because God loves man and because he wants man to be happy. God is more concerned about your happiness than you are. God has done more to achieve your happiness than you have done. God has done more to remove barriers to that happiness than you have done. God wants you to be saved more than you do. God wants you to be delivered from your temptations more than you do. God wants you to be forgiven more than you want to be forgiven. You can never care as much for yourself and for your salvation as God does. So long as we understand that and know the grace of God, we have joy in Christianity. It is when we fail to understand that and assume that the only way God will accept us is if we are like the 12 years, you see, then we're miserable because we constantly are aware of the fact that we are falling short. So the three points that I've tried to make about God's dream and those things which make up a part of God's dream are first of all that God has made man as a creature with tremendous potential. What does that mean for you as a child of God? What does it mean for the church? What does it say might happen? Secondly, we are creatures. And the happiness that is designed for us is the happiness designed for creatures. And we defy God's dream and defeat God's dream when we deny our creatureliness and say to God, no thanks, I can handle this on my own. And we try to set up on our own, which is a lie and cannot work. And thirdly, God's dream involves the fact that he loves us and he is determined that we be happy. We seem to be determined to be unhappy. And so the story that we get in Genesis 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and all the way through, go down to the end, is of human beings doing their best to be unhappy and God saying, whatever you do to be unhappy, I'm going to come back and do something else to make you happy. And so he just always one-ups us. And he says, I'm determined. I will not give up. I am determined that you are going to be happy. There is a, a scene in uh, the first of C.S. Lewis's uh, space trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, <coughs> in which uh, Ransom, the uh, man from Earth, is given a view of Earth from Mars, and there uh, inquiries are made of him from, uh, by the Saroni, who are strange Martian creatures, who want to know about Earth, because Earth is the silent planet. And Ransom finds himself embarrassed. 
when he's out in space looking back at earth to try to describe what's to be found there. And he is profoundly humiliated as he talks about wars and prostitution and slavery and crime and drunkenness and drugs and all that stuff that you saw in the 10 o'clock news last night or is it 11 o'clock here? And all that stuff that you, that you saw in the paper this morning when you picked it up that's happening in the world that's not even making the front pages now because there aren't that many people being killed there. It's been going on so long that we've become ardent to it. Is this God's dream? Is this what God wants the world to be? It is not the kind of world that God intends where the environment is hostile, where evil prevails, where men set up on their own with no thought of a higher power, where men are in conflict with each other, where men are overwhelmed with a sense of not the kind of world that God intends. And the call to people and the acceptance of that call by Christian people is that little something that is done by each one of us to understand that the big picture that we see in the world today is not God's dream, but we have understood God's dream and we have incarnated it in our own lives and we are doing best to incarnate it in the lives of others. I want to talk tomorrow about the shattering of God's dream and the consequences of that and the text will center mainly in the third chapter of Genesis. Shall we pray together? Dear Lord, we thank you that you do love us beyond anything that we can imagine. And we pray that as we labor in this pilgrimage in our hearts of how much we are cared for, help us to build our lives on that reality, to find our confidence coming from you, to be bold, to enact your dream in our lives and as we can in the world around us. Open doors for us, give us opportunities, help us to be as Christ to those who are around us. Use us always to your glory is our prayer through Christ.